2,300 volunteers. Uh, that means that we are usually first on scene. So we, we take part in uh, a bit over 70% of all rescues. Uh, and if you if you take away the helicopters, we actually so you just count the 
the waterborne operations, we're actually up, up to 80, almost 90% of all, all rescues. Um, we've been around for um, 110 years, and these are our bylaws. We are to promote sea rescue, so, so that's, we're a lobby organization, first and foremost. Uh, and we are to propose ways to enhance sea rescue. Uh, you could, of course, say, that not that the same thing? Uh, we, we've seen it as, as um, the first one as being sort of pointing at the government to, to, to keep them alert to the fact that there is a need for sea rescue. And the second one is, is more practical. It, it can be pointing out things that needs to be done, or it can be um, actually uh, developing stuff or, or making corporations where, where good things can happen. And the last one, and the third one, is, is to actually provide sea rescue services. And that's, of course, if, if we have failed with the two first ones, and there is still need for extra sea rescue, well, then we have to step in and do that. And we, as I said, we do that quite a bit. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to talk about one uh, pet project. I think uh, you are all uh, uh, very much into uh, the maritime sector. I'm going to take you up a little bit in the air here. Uh, we have a, a drone project that we're working on, uh, and we think that that eventually we'll have these little drones uh, all around the coast, and we will have a central operator, which today happens to be me. So while I'm Standing here, I get this message, so you'll have to bear with me. But this is sea rescue business. So uh, obviously, there's a, a person in the water um, up by Mastron. So I click that link, and in this future vision, I would uh, then have this system uh, to show me all the all the little green dots, happy drones, with their slightly bigger um, dots around, which is a 30 kilometer radius, that's what we practically fly with these things. Uh, and the red dot, of course, is where we had a, a, a man overboard just. So, so let's go to that position. The system will then uh, pre-plan a, a couple of routes for me, uh, uh, taking the wind into consideration. So even though Shahan is the closest one, uh, it's a quicker flight from Röre. Let's choose a route which is not over any people, and uh, we'll be there in seven minutes. Uh, and we'll just have a quick look from the launcher, just to see that there are no kids climbing on it. Or, or anything. That, lo that looks good, so let's hit launch. Uh, if I hadn't been talking to you, this whole process would have taken something like 30 to 45 seconds. Um, and from the operator's view, it would look like something like this. Now, all this is sort of the technicalities that we're trying to get into place, but the money shot, as they say, oops, sorry, is this one. Do we get some? Yeah. So this is what we hope uh, to be able to show in the dressing room at the rescue station or in, in the voluntary rescue crews uh, um, mobile phones or, or where, wherever they can get it. Um, our crews, they, we have mandated that the boat, the rescue boat, should be uh, on its way uh, at most 15 minutes after a call. And uh, the mean time is 12 minutes, so we have a very short time span to, to do this, because we want to show them these images before they leave the dock. That would mean that we could give them just a clearer picture of what's waiting, uh, so they can make better decisions. Uh, one of those decisions might be that, hey, that doesn't really look so scary. We can probably take a slower route uh, around, uh, maybe lower the speed, that will decrease the risks, both for our crew and, and for others in the archipelago. Um, it might be a choice of, of choosing the big or the small boat, waiting for more crew, and, and so on. How am I on time? Are we? You finished? You were short just before you started. Good. <laughs> um, I'd love to talk to you much more about this. Um, come up, see me. Uh,
upstairs, and I'll, I'll tell you more. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, very uh, suiting presentation for this day. And you do a lot of nice things, and hopefully you can come back and tell us some more. Thank you. My name is Osa Birman, I forgot to tell, and I'm the director of the Lighthouse, but I have uh, talked to a lot of you before and outside also. Uh, I hope you will have an interesting day. I'd like to start with just showing what Lighthouse is, and this will be very brief. Um, what you see up there for a competitive, sustainable and safe maritime sector with a good working environment, that is our vision. And uh, that is where we want to be, uh, and that is what this day is also about. We work in triple helix, meaning that we are very, uh, it's very nice to see both uh, academia and institutes, industry, as well as society uh, in the meetings we have, in the work we do. We have three tasks, creating collaborative research and networking platforms. And this is one of the ways we do it, uh, by arranging seminars, by matchmaking, uh, by uh, trying to get people to work together on the needs of the maritime sector. Providing support and resources for maritime research, we will probably change that wording because we're just now in a tanding discussion with a traffic um, market. So, but what we do there is actually we have some programs uh, that we show in this picture and you will see uh, a couple of them today in order to get people to work together and also to address important questions we do pre-studies um, we also have a postdoc program and we will you will meet four of the five postdocs uh, that lighthouse are supporting um, we have a trainee program for naval architects with six uh, companies and hopefully one or two more will join and these naval architects um, they have a program where they are three to four months at uh, each company <coughs> and one of these uh, periods are abroad preferably in South Korea when they're actually at the shipyard and then we do matchmaking we try to get people together uh, with that have similar interests and needs. And the third thing we do is spreading knowledge and creating interest, um, not for the whole maritime sector maybe, but for what is happening, uh, new regulations, uh, new knowledge, new research. And, uh, but we also want, of course, the general public to know more about um, the maritime sector and also uh, to know that it's quite important. I will stop there and you can ask me questions anytime uh, during the breaks. And now I would like to continue to uh, this, uh, the next uh, paragraph of this meeting, report from Lighthouse Priest that is, and uh, we will show a uh, very short uh, six of the pre studies that we have uh, that have been performed in this uh, lighthouse network the first one sustainability indices for shipping Karen Anderson <coughs> professor uh, Chalmers will present this very welcome you also you hear me uh, probably not So, we are a couple of people that have been working on a pre-study and uh, this is about sustainability in this, this for shipping and the, the amount of people is not proportional to the size of the study but to, to the scope of the study. We have been covering many different things and use different competences. That's a long list of, of people. And uh, what, what's this about? 
I think I showed this a year ago, but what can we do? And what was it all about? And it's how could a system for sustainability classification of ships look like? And you know that there are different kinds of indices, there are lots of indices, but uh, they don't cover all areas. And we, the idea was to see, is can, can we improve, can we include new areas? Uh, I think I'll skip that one. Uh, in 2011, some of us made uh, another study and showed that, well, if you look for a sustainability index and shipping in, on the internet and literature and wherever, that at that time we found 38 different initiatives and that has increased since. Uh, many of those are, well, within uh, different uh, societies where you pay membership fee and it's difficult to see them, they're not very transparent, but they're also others that are quite transparent and also can be relevant for well, mostly environment but in, for sustainability in general. And I think this list still holds, they have been improved since 2011, but you have some initiatives where you can see the Clean Shipping Index, that's the Swedish one that's used in the fairway fee system, but also different uh, initiatives from different parts of the world. Uh, I'll show you a little what they cover. We tried to, or I think it was Sara who made this fantastic table that's in the report, uh, trying to compare what do all these initiatives cover, because they have many, many different aspects. And the main reason for making indices, that's usually to, about energy efficiency and uh, well, carbon dioxide, and sometimes also impact on the air by NOx, SOx, and particles. And there you see that most of these that we're looking to cover that. So that's, that's the main purpose. Uh, if you go to the water environment, then uh, they become a little different. Uh, you have well, everything from anti-fouling paint, cleaning agents, chemicals on board in various, uh, various mm -hmm. kinds, ballast water treatment, black water, whatever. Uh, Clean Shipping Index, Blue Angel, Green Award, uh, well, the triple E perhaps are quite, have quite high coverage on that, but others are not interested in the water environment, that's only for air. So, well, different aspects of sustainability or environment. Then, well, that sustainability is a large concept, it's about uh, uh, social and economic aspects as well, and if you look at social on board, if you want to class uh, a ship from sustainability point of view, the work environment is of course of interest, and then, well, the differences are great and there are quite few aspects, like crew awareness, and you have, in the bottom you have personal management development and policy management of the shipping company. Uh, and there are other things like noise, dust, uh, impact import that are not, <laughs> not very well covered e either. So, then there are well, more technical things, then it's easier again to, to make indices. I think this is about how, how easy it is to find data sometimes also. Uh, Blue Angel and Green Award are very much focused on technology and technical systems. Ship recycling is found in Blue Angel and uh, Clean Shipping Index, but that's, uh, it's quite little coverage. It's just say, do you have a plan for, or do you ma is it mentioned in any way? It's not very much about how it's done. That's probably because it's quite, it's, it's still quite tricky with Hong Kong Convention and EU rules and whatever. Uh, and on the bottom line you see something that's third party verification. Well, if you have an index that tells you how tells people how good you are, then it's also good that someone else is verifying what you're saying, and that's not obvious for all indices. There are lots of environmental indices that are well self-declaration and no verification. And of these, you have it for Blue Angel, Clean Shipping, DMV, and well, partly for the CCWG also. But it's it's also an aspect that it's open at least to verify what you're doing. Uh, okay, 
what can be done? How can you go further from this? That was the intention of this uh, study to see, can, can we add something? Can we do something about these empty parts? And we looked into environmental, uh, taking more economical impact. Uh, there is, for instance, very much focus on developing ways of valuing ecosystem services, what, you, what nature can provide, anything from keeping climate to uh, providing uh, well, recreation areas to provide food, anything. And had a look at what can be done there. It's still, well, it's not so easy to, put, to take into a, an index today because it's under development, but it's a possible way of looking at how do we, how can we get the services we need from nature, not only looking at impacts. Uh, looking at more cost for society, uh, health aspects, life length, and such things that's treated in many other areas, and it could be something that could be included. Uh, there are other ways of valuing the, the econo or setting economic value to different impacts, abatement cost for environment, or willingness to pay for, for changes. But these are well, not present today, but could be perhaps something. Uh, then, there's, if you look at the report, that it's printed and or available at the homepage, as far as I know. Uh, we had a special look at uh, what could be done to the social aspects. Is this a, a ship where you have good working conditions, uh, which uh, having people in a good way and so on. And just made an overview of all the regulations that are. And could this be used in some way to see uh, if these are fulfilled or uh, applied or, or so in. And uh, this is more of, uh, today is more of a list that these are, that there are many uh, regulations or uh, uh, sets of standards that could be used to make an, an index. We haven't made the index. And you see that there's in the labor conventions, uh, the IMO has safety management systems, European Union, uh, various labor laws that also apply to seafarers. We have national legislations. These are examples from the Swedish area. And there are other non-mandatory things international transport workers federations and others and the classification societies of course they also have their sets so there are many things that could be used it's not about inventing the wheel but the, the question is how do you get this into an index so what would we conclude well many indices and initiatives and uh, some of them the csi and some others are quite comprehensive, they have lots of relevant aspects. Uh, I didn't mention so much, but uh, there is a use of CSI in fair weight use, and that well, could be more evaluated of the, what, what has happened there. Uh, in technology, well, in scrapping, I said it's included, but it's not developed, it's just said that we take this into consideration. Uh, <coughs> There is, well, I think it's one, there's one index that is only for ports and used by port federations, but the general for ships that does not take what happens in ports or, or how the ships in, impact ports into account. So that could perhaps be an area that could be included. And of course, social aspects, large area where potentially it could be included. So, go further from this. Uh, or the main one well, on the wish list. Look at the possibility to develop, develop indicators for work environment and working conditions uh, that well, could be used in the classification in, in addition to the environmental part. Uh, then look at what could be done on socio-economic socio cost assessment. Uh, and follow the development. It's, I said it's not very mature, but could be, in the future could come some possibilities there. We're looking at economic stability, we discussed that. Can we class ships or shipping companies from well, how economically stable they are? And well, we're not sure it could be done, but if it could be done, that's also 
some kind of indicator on the conditions the ship is operating under. Uh, and uh, then we have information from uh, the monitoring uh, reporting verification system could add more data and there could be a connection of an index to the reporting system but that's that's also to investigate but the main further development is include the, the social aspects the work environment thank you thank you and uh, we don't have uh, so much time for questions but Karin is leaving um, Yes. So, if <laughs> you have a process. specific question for her, uh, think of that. Yeah, well, thank you, Soren. Uh, but if I understand correctly, these indices you presented, they are more static. You report what you did the last quarter or what you did the last year. And then you get a rating somehow. Yes. Yeah. That, that's so, what um, can be done, yeah. I guess. <laughs> So, uh, did you consider more uh, the, the uh, possibility of a future more dynamic index where actually the ship in its, uh, let's say, oh yes, in the uh, transmits uh, their environmental performance in real time? It's interesting. Oh, well, but then we come to all this uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence and big data and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps. I, I, it's an interesting idea. We haven't discussed it in, in this study, but it's an interesting idea. There are more and more monitoring systems installed and uh, people trying to draw conclusions. So, of course, this could be an area. You're right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and now we uh, hope you will have a nice day, even though you will not be staying. Really. <laughs> uh, and uh, I would like to welcome uh, the next person. And as Kari said, uh, there is a, you can look at the report, there is one outside, but you can also find it on our website. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Sofia Werner, researcher at SSPA, who talk about improved performance forecasting and optimization of ship operation. concerns uh, methods for assessments of the performance of ships. And the type of performance that I'm talking about is the hydrodynamic performance, which means the shape of the underwater hull and the propeller, <coughs> uh, which is of course very linked to the energy consumption. So ships are, as you know, built in very small series and only uh, one single ship can cost a billion dollars to build, so there is no room for trial and error. Uh, the, the hydrodynamic design has to be optimized from the beginning, before the ship is, is built. <coughs> and the design process can be uh, either to, to gradually improve or change uh, hull form and uh, uh, in each iteration, uh, assess uh, whether it was a, a good uh, change or not. Uh, it can also be the situation where we <coughs> have to compare very different uh, concepts uh, coming from different uh, providers of, of a design, for example. In any case, we have to assess uh, and uh, make a selection uh, to, to, to select the optimal case. As an example of uh, 
the importance of this assessment. This, uh, if we, uh, for example, compare these uh, propellers, and uh, one of the propellers actually performs 3% better. And if we build this ship in 10 sister vessels, and each sail in 25 years, that means 500,000 uh, tons of carbon dioxide. So if we make the wrong selection here, if we cannot assess which propeller is the best, we will uh, give 500,000 tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere <coughs> for no use. So it's very clear that this assessment step is extremely important uh, in the design phase. But uh, to do this uh, correct, of course, we need accurate prediction methods, and that is the uh, fundamental motivation for this study. So what uh, prediction methods do we have? At the last uh, 100 years, we have used a model test, uh, which we call experimental fluid dynamics, EFD, to make this assessment. And all the international standards and regulations that we have today are based on, on model tests. Uh, but uh, nowadays we also have computational tools, CFD, as, uh, uh, that we can use alongside. So if we look at the development of, of, of these methods over time, so the, the model test uh, developed uh, since uh, William Frude uh, formulated the scaling laws that we actually use still today. And a milestone that we can mention is the development of the ITC 78 method, if you heard about that. It was developed by a Swedish researcher at SSPA, and it's used as standard worldwide. But as I said, we also have uh, the development of uh, computational-based methods, CFD, uh, since the last 30-40 years. And the development <coughs> of that tool has is, been very uh, steep and optimistic. So everybody is expecting uh, that we will soon have the day when, when CFD overtakes a model test and uh, we can close down all the model test facilities. Uh, the problem is that CFD is not one method, it's, it's a way floor our methods. Uh, some uh, advanced uh, tools might uh, be very accurate and safe, but we also have uh, less accurate methods and also <coughs> depends on who is using the code and how it's set up and so on. And the problem is that it's, uh, the user, the client, uh, cannot judge which, which uh, solution you will get in this flora. <coughs> so many people see model test and CFD as a, as a conflict, uh, maybe, maybe because they have de been developed by uh, different uh, groups and different organizations. But of course the, that is nonsense, there are uh, strengths and weaknesses in, in both methods, so the only sensible thing is to, to combine them in the best way. So that's what, what we believe that now we have to... to start to develop real uh, combined methods and introduce that in the international rules and regulations. <coughs> so to the direct result of, of this pre-study. In the spring we had a industry workshop with the Swedish industry and the universities authorities and SSPA. And uh, the outcome was a wide consensus on that there is a great need to develop the today's methods for uh, assessing ship performance in the design phase. And also a consensus of, on that uh, Sweden can and should take a leading role in, in this uh, development globally. So that gave us uh, confidence to, to formulate the research agenda and uh, start uh, writing applications uh, to, to start uh, carrying out this uh, research work. And so far, uh, we have received a grant from Vinova, uh, 4.5 million, so we will start a PhD project uh, in this, uh, with this scope uh, in January. Uh, but um, even if we develop very smart and new, new methods, 
there's no uh, no point in having these new methods if we cannot uh, spread uh, to the rest of the world and uh, introduce them in the international uh, rules and regulations. So therefore we also took the initiative to uh, start a new technical committee under ITTC. So it's called uh, the Specialist Committee for Combined CFD EFD Methods and started in September this year. And uh, SSPI is now heading this committee for at least three years. And we are ten people from eight countries who will uh, work specifically on these topics. So of course we, we, we think we cannot solve uh, the whole uh, problem with these steps, but uh, we think we, are, we have a good start and we have a good platform to cooperate in Sweden and also to spread uh, the results to the international community and uh, hopefully <coughs> we will uh, succeed in, in uh, introducing combined CFD EFD methods in the international standards. Thank you. Yes. And you are actually the chairman of that committee, yes. aren't you? Yes. And we hope to see uh, ITC 2018 maybe, or 2019 as the new method for, yes. <laughs> for uh, the ship owners to test the ships. Um, Next speaker, uh, Nika Tay from uh, Rice Victoria, earlier Chalmers. And uh, this is a totally different topic again indoor positioning on row row vessels. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, correct. Uh, my name is Mikael Hedge. I'm from Rice Victoria. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, I am not uh, the person that made this uh, study. It was performed by uh, Robert Rylander and Christopher uh, Englund at uh, Rice Victoria in cooperation with Stena Technik and also Valenius Willemsen. So I'm sorry for that, so maybe I can't answer your questions fully, but there is a report, as you can see, uh, where you can find more information. Uh, this is a quite... Um, this is a quite detailed study, actually, where we go into some... Uh, a very special use case, but you should see this in, in a larger context within the maritime informatics, which is one of the lighthouse areas. So where we, we look at the, the, uh, up co uh, the, the connected ship and the connected port, and we look at ship-to-shore interaction, ship-to-ship -ship interaction, etc. So it's a quite detailed study, but it can be placed in this connected ship context. So therefore, I think this is very interesting. And this study was, of course, then founded by Lighthouse, and there you can see the, the different partners, Stena, Willensum, and, and Rice. So, uh, digitalization can be used in several ways to meet and try to solve so, some of the challenges. And here we have looked at rural cargo and the position of rural cargo and identification of rural cargo. And some of the challenges here is, for instance, onboard safety. Today, it, will be, it is more and more common that you have alternative fuel vehicles coming on board uh, the ships can be natural gas, hybrid, electric cars. And they are mixed with ordinary cars, so, so to say. So you really want to know where these cars are located. Because the, the, there are now some uh, safety issues with respect to these new type of cars, with respect to accidents and fires. You need to have a new type of fire fighting tactics. You need to have different type of extenders uh, to put out this type of fire. So we have some onboard safety aspects actually. And also digitalization can be used also to automate some functions. For instance, when the car comes aboard the vessel, it is manually checked today by crew 
Uh, this can be automated, uh, and you can also use that information both to keep it on board the ship, but also in the terminal and, and on, on the shore side. So digitization gives us some new openings here. And also actually stability control, so that you have full control of where you have your different cars. There is one example actually, and uh, the, there was an accident in the English Channel, uh, with the car carrier, uh, Hög Osaka, that made some changes in discharging and loading cars that, set, that was not correct to, to the, the cargo plan and had some stability problems actually and, and the, the, the vessel was uh, stranded in order not to capsize. So here you could actually uh, have a way to monitor the cargo cargo location, and by that the cargo plan and stability. There are some regulations, but not actually as much as you might think, and there is a difference if you bring the cargo uh, aboard a uh, car in different pieces, for instance, or if you drive the car aboard yourself. There are some uh, strength more stringent requirements now, uh, but, but still it's quite uh, not so regulated actually. Uh, if you look at the IMGS code for instance, the dangerous cargo code for instance. So uh, the idea here was to have an automatic system that identify the cargo coming on board, that you can track the cargo going to the different cargo holes, and then have the correct position of each car or row row cargo and then also if possible to monitor this cargo during the voyage and therefore we, we looked at several different uh, technical solutions camera based camera based uh, and, and using camera you can fulfill all these different type of functions detect track position etc it can of course be quite costly to especially to retrofit a uh, complete camera system. We also looked at uh, RFID, and this is very good for identification. You can use it also for tracking, but maybe not for positioning. And the RFID is not fully standardized, so you have different frequencies, for instance, in North America and Europe, Asia, etc. So there are some still problems with RFID. We have also looked at ultra wide based communication. Car navigators have some kind of communication system. Some is used during the manufacture in the plant, uh, etc. But this type of communication is not at all standardized, so, so we couldn't really find uh, a way forward uh, there. Uh, in, in order to put up the right uh, user requirements, we, we analyzed the, the the flow of cargo from, from the uh, plant actually to the terminal, aboard the vessel, aboard the vessel, and then sometimes in port you have to do some changes, um, drive off some cars and then load them again and still update uh, the cargo plan, and then a new uh, voyage. So, so the orange bars here is, is the vessel and, and the, uh, and the uh, voyage. And the different blue dots here is some, some kind of processes uh, along the way. Uh, we come up with two solutions. Uh, one is camera based, uh, where we identify the barcode uh, automatically. And this, was, this information is then sent to logging and uh, both shore and, and onboard side. And then you, you have integrated several cameras to be able to track the cars going aboard and the position of it and then monitor, uh, monitor the cargo during the transport. We also looked at, the, at an RFID solution where uh, we used RFID for identification and then in combination with cameras for tracking and positioning. So camera was very important, so we, we did some actual practical trials on board uh, uh, Valenius vessel here in, in the port. So we, we mounted the cam camera on the cargo hold and just to learn about the practical difficulties. And it's very important to understand the dimensions of the cargo hold 
in order to place the camera uh, in the right position and, and so forth. So we learned, learned uh, quite a lot. And we use that uh, to set up different types of configurations. Uh, I will we analyze several configurations. I will just go through uh, some of them. <coughs> here, for instance, you can see the blue dots here is, is the camera and the field of view for, from the cameras. And in this configuration, you require quite a lot of cameras, actually, which is costly. Um, the positive side is that you have a redundance, both if you have shadowing effects from other cars or failures of, of uh, cameras. And more, maybe more optimized way of configuring the cameras is uh, along the center line of the cargo hold. And uh, this is uh, a bit more optimized, uh, we would say. And we come up with uh, also one very innovative solution. Um, maybe in the future, to have a drone flying uh, around and uh, then you don't need um, uh, this fixed installation. Of course, there's a lot of trouble uh, with the, the height of the cargo space, etc., etc. So th this was more on the a funny idea, I would say, but still, still uh, maybe in the future. So, um, to conclude, uh, we think that this type of system based on, on on a camera uh, solution would give us a lot of benefits. You get an automatic identification of the cargo, automatic position of each car, you will automatically upload the cargo plan and calculate your uh, cargo stability, your vessel stability. Uh, also, during the, 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 the voyage, you can monitor the car if you have an accident, a fire, something like that. This is much faster than the normal fire detectors. We can also see for, for persons not, that shouldn't be there, so you have a kind of a security arrangement as well. And uh, we, we think that Valenius will, will implement some of this, uh, but we are also looking for a more proof of concept where we can try this out and especially connect this to more systems. So remember this connected vessel, this is just one piece in a, a whole concept of the connected vessel. Okay. Thank you. And you can also, of course, find this uh, report on our website. And uh, we will just continue. Uh, as you see, uh, we say we are cross-sectional, uh, we uh, are interested in very diverse uh, things. <coughs> So the next is not a, a completed study, it's uh, in progress, yes. calculation of transport work and emissions uh, with the new regulations MRV. Erik Friedel from Ilya. Thank you. So you hear me now? So we, we've had a... <laughs> so we have this... Uh, Pre-study, we looked at the MRV system, and I realized this morning that I never actually write on this slide what it means, but it means measuring, reporting, and verifying, which is a system in the EU to, to uh, measure, ver report, and verify carbon dioxide emissions from shipping. So we, we looked into this system a little bit. Yes. So my name is Eric Friedel, and this has been a study with uh, uh, IVL and Chalmers. Uh, also, some ship owners provided us uh, with data for this study. So, so it's a pilot project. Uh, we we are we have some ish, some items left to finish, but we are almost there. We should be finished within this year. It's been me and Sebastian Bexter mainly at IVL working with this, and Henrik Palm at uh, Chalmers University. So the idea was to look at issues with, ship on, with MRE for ship owners, maybe if there is a need of support and potential use of, of the data that will be come out in the MRE app that I will explain about later. So the projects included that we looked into all the details of the MRE system. Uh, we did an assessment of, of uh, the MRE system, of the, data, the quality of the data, we'll come back to that. We had a workshop with uh, industry and academia and others to discuss this that was that was before uh, that was in June it was very 
a good workshop, I think. There was a lot of issues that came up and we discussed. We made some calculations on, on uh, real data from ships uh, that I don't have time to show today. It will be in the report. We looked at uh, the, an uncertainty assessment of the data. I will show some of that. Uh, we have, a, have had a discussions also at the workshop of how this data can be used and, and what future projects could be, could be done in, in uh, alignment with the MIT system. So first, why do, we, why do we get this? As I said, this is a system decided by the European Union and uh, there's a lot of documentation <coughs> and, uh, of, of, uh, to motivate this and I will of course not go through all of that. It's just a lot of text. You can just read the, the bold parts. Um, so, the, the, the was, it was decided a long time ago, in 2009 in the EU, that if there is no international agreement on shipping, on how, how to reduce CO2 emissions, uh, then the European Union would do something by themselves. So this was sort of blackmail on the, on the IMO, you could say. And then IMO didn't do the system, so the EU had to go forward. And then, of course, they, they state that there is a significant impact from, clip, from shipping on, on uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, and they also say that, which, is, which was true then, that, uh, that international maritime shipping is the only means of transportation that is not included in the European Union in, in measures to redu reduce greenhouse emissions since, since uh, airplanes are included in a, in a trading system, be decided. And it has also been decided in the European Union that the emissions from the transport sector should be significantly reduced in the future. And then they also uh, look at the, what IMO has done. They have the EED, EEDI system and the, and the SEEMP system that you probably know about. And that they, they, they state that these cannot lead to necessary absolute reductions. They will lead to reductions on per ship, but if the shipping in increases as expected, then you will still have an increase in the emissions if you just have the EDI system. And they also state that there are, and this is actually data from IMO2, that it is possible to have strong reductions of, of CO2 emissions from shipping with different measures. So this is sort of the background. And what the, so what the EU is planning, sorry, no, I thought I had another slide, is to, to first, uh, measure measure this uh, CO2 emissions from shipping. That's the first step, and that's starting now next year. So we show you. And then what they want to do is to to set up a goal, set up an objective of how should shipping emissions be in the future. And after that, they will decide on a policy instrument on how to reach that goal. So I, I expect that we will have some sort of policy instrument, trading scheme, uh, tax, whatever you want to call it, or something else by in five years or so from now. So this is the, this is the time plan for the MRV. Uh, in this summer, all ships had, <coughs> ship owners had to submit a monitoring plan to a verifier, and that has to, had to be assessed by, by the end of the year uh, by the verifier, which is usually uh, uh, the class societies, could be also others. And the reporting, first reporting period starts 1st of January in 2018, and it ends then last of December 2018. And then you have, all the ship owners have to submit a verified emission reports to, to the European Commission and to the flag state by <coughs> end of April next year in 2019. And then they get a document uh, to keep, that they have to keep on board by summer. And also in the summer 2019, the first date that will would be publicly available for all these ships. I'll come back to what kind of data that is. So this is what all ships from next year, all ships that that reach that at least once per year a port in the European Union, uh, what they have to monitor for these voyages. It's only voyages from one port to a port in the European Union, or between ports in the European Union, or from a port in the European Union out to another port that has to be monitored. So they don't have to monitor these trips between uh, Africa and South America and so on. But for each, for each voyage they have to monitor the fuel consumption divided by at sea and at berth, the time at sea, the distance traveled, uh, the cargo carried, uh, the transport work done, which is the distance multiplied by the cargo carried, and the fuel efficiency. 
which is the fuel consumption per uh, distance traveled and per transport work. So this has to be done monitor for each voyage. And this has to be checked by the verifier. Uh, oops. Oh, you can't see all of this. Uh, yes, to, to mention, I will not go through this in detail, but it will be in the report for those who are interested. Uh, that th there's been long discussions on what is actually cargo, how you define that for different ship types. And for most ship types, uh, the first line there, it's simply the mass of the cargo that is carried. It should be counted a cargo. For LNG carriers, it's the volume. For passenger ships, of course, it's the number of passengers. And then you have for, for row row, you, can, you have some choices. You can look at the actual mass, or you can look at the occupied lane meters multiplied by some default mass, or cargo units multiplied by default mass. And also for container ships, you have you have two options. Uh, either uh, the number of uh, 20 foot equivalent units divided by uh, uh, default mass or the actual mass, if you know that. This will of course influence your results somehow. So, those, so what I show here was what has to be monitored for each trip, but that is not what will be published. What will be published is annual average data. And that is what all of us will be able to access by the summer of 2019 for all ships that have traveled to Europe in 2018. So there we will find uh, the amount of fuel consumed and the emission factors used for all different fuel types used. Uh, emissions of CO2, aggregated emissions for all voyages. Uh, emissions divide, it's divided by imports uh, and on, uh, on sea, total distance traveled by the ship on these journeys that comes to the European Union or go from the European Union, total time spent at sea and total transport work done during the year. And, and that is also then recalculated to what they call fuel efficiency parameters, which is the fuel consumption per distance. So that's the average fuel consumption per nautical mile. And also fuel consumption per transport work. So that's the gram of, or the kilogram of fuel used per ton kilometer of transport work done. And then the course, also this is also calculated to CO2 emissions per distance and per transport work. So this will be available as an annual average for all ships. Uh, and also in the report there will be, there are a lot of details on how you report that will influence your results. The most important one is that you have actually four options to measure your fuel consumption. You can use uh, bunker delivery nodes, or you can monitor your, your fuel tank uh, at different times on board or between each journey. Or you can, uh, you can get uh, really good flow meters, and then you will, have a much, you will have a much better assessment of your fuel consumption. Or you can actually, there's something called a direct emission measurement, where you measure CO2 concentration in the exhaust together with the exhaust gas flow. I don't think anyone will use that, at least not next year. But when we looked at this, we think that the quality of the data will vary a lot between these methods. And, and by far the best, best one is, is uh, the one with flow meters. So we did a, this is just an example, we looked into what kind of uh, accuracy you can expect in the numbers. And this is an example, we looked at the emission of CO2 per transport work for a ship with some assumptions. And we assumed that it had a really good, very good, really good flow meter in this case. But even though we assume that, I mean, there are certainties in, in, the, in the cargo carried. This is a container vessel we looked at. And there are certainties actually also in the distance you monitor. You can do that in different ways too. So this is just an example. So what this shows is that for this particular calculation, the, the mean value is 33.7 grams of CO2 per ton kilometer for this ship. Ton, sorry, ton nautical mile for this ship. And you can see that the 95% confidence interval is between about 30 and 37. So that's a quite a, a large uncertainty in this data. So for an individual, in, an individual ship, the, the uncertainties are still significant, we think. And some of the things that that we looked at, uh, we looked at, I mean, we tried to assess how good is this system, and we found two things that are not, is this a, yeah, that, that we think could be improved. And one thing is that um, 
Well, one thing that is uncertain actually in the system is well, how do you treat biofuels? I mean, this has not been a big issue. There's not a lot of biofuels used in shipping. Could be more in the future. Uh, we talked to the Commission about this, and they say that CO2 coming from biofuels should not be counted, probably. But if you look in all the documentation, there is no mention of that. So, and, and usually when you report CO2 emissions, you don't count biogenic CO2 emissions, so you don't count CO2 from, from biofuels. So, uh, that's one thing. And another thing is that uh, other greenhouse gases, uh, mainly methane, are not included in the system, and also upstream uh, emissions, that, that is, emissions from producing the fuel are not included. For example, if, if, you, uh, if you take just residual oil, there's very low emissions in, in producing that. But if you, if you have methanol made from natural gas, actually you have significant emissions of CO2 from, from the production, and even though you have lower from the actual engine. So, so in this table, we, we analyzed what kind of uh, errors you would introduce uh, by not looking at the well-to-wheel perspective and not looking at the other other greenhouse gases, and these are significant if you look at, if you look at, uh, for example, methanol or, or LNG. And LNG, it's significant because you have large emissions of uh, methane there. So, some just to end up, some final remark. All the data should be publicly available. It's, it's still a bit uncertain, but the, the latest documents we've seen, it seems pretty clear that anyone should be able to access this. As I said, it's unclear how biofuels will be treated. We will have to clarify that. Other greenhouse gases are not included and, and upstream emissions are not included either in this system. That is, those two things are clear. So we've been, we also been in here discussing at the workshop and so on what we can do in the future. Uh, one thing we would like to do is to do this uncertainty analysis more carefully and to collect real data from ships on uncertainty in, in measuring fuel consumption, for example, in different ways, but also all the other ingoing parameters. And then, in uh, a year and a half from now, when all the data is available, we think there are a lot of opportunities to use this data as benchmarking, for example, for indexes, and also there's a lot of problems to calculate emissions from, from shipping that will have much better data than we have now, actually, in the future, when this becomes available. So, there I am. Thank you. Talking about uh, biofuels, the next um, pre-study is about green sea transport. Is it possible to get uh, the companies that are buying transport to pay extra for greener fuels? We'll see. Will Davines uh, will give a presentation about this. Okay. Is this okay? So, hi. Um, so, I will present a, a pre study that, that we run on IBN, Swedish Environmental Research Institute, together with, uh, together with the School of Business, Economics and Law at Gothenburg University. It's called Fossil Free Sea Cargo and it's about uh, introducing biofuels as blending fuels uh, on ships. Um, so, I will go through the objectives of our pre-study and, uh, and where we are now because we are not finished. We still have to write the report and so on. And, uh, and also what we see before us. Mm. So the main project objectives is to lay ground for a pilot project or a des demonstration project rather on, on introduction of fossil fuel liquid fuels for shipping. So where we actually our goal is to actually see this happen, make this happen. And uh, within the pre-study, we are more focused on designing this system or model or platform where we can actually connect different, oops, different actors. Sorry. If you wonder why we are using this, it's because we're streaming, oh, so we okay. can get the sound. Um, so, um, 
so in the pre-study we are more focused on, on, on finding, finding a business case, finding for which cargo owners it can be interesting. For. What we're looking at is, to, uh, is a system where we use um, biofuels as drop-in fuels and, and the cargo owners we see as the, the actual driving force. They will, they will force this thing to happen, so to say. Uh, a cargo owner that, that wants to buy a green transport on a ship uh, should be able to do so with the help of, of the platform that we design and the offer should be from the ship owner. So it's very important for us to find the right actors for this, uh, uh, for this study uh, in order to, to have the demonstration project later on. So, so uh, the models that we have looked at that have kind of inspired us for this is, uh, is green electricity that you can buy from, from your electricity providers, uh, the DHL service of green mines, uh, where, which is kind of similar to this, where you as a transporter can, can buy, uh, pay an extra fee uh, and make sure that you have biofuels in the tanks of, 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 the, of the truck. Or, or the system where if you use gas as fuel for your car, you can, you can, can pay an extra fee and make sure that biogas is added to the, the gas distribution net in proportions uh, equal to what you use in your car when you drive instead, instead of, uh, of natural gas. Uh, so it's something similar to this that, that we look at uh, for our study. So, so it's not that the ship should, should uh, use only biofuels, but rather that they will add biofuels in the amount that corresponds to what is needed uh, for, for the cargo owner's need. Uh, yes, so uh, in our study, the main focus has been to, to find, like I said, the right actors. So we have had a lot of discussions with fuel providers and cargo owners and engine manufacturers. Uh, it has been very important for us to see what, uh, what technical possibilities and problems there may be uh, with this. Uh, and what, what we can see is uh, from that the, the, technical, uh, the technical issues can be overcome like normal, but, but uh, that doesn't mean they're not important. But but they can be overcome, but, but it's mainly an issue of, uh, of, uh, of finding the, uh, the economic uh, uh, or, or describing the economic uh, conditions uh, around uh, this, this uh, system. Uh, to do this, we, um, uh, or I could say that we have seen similar systems like this for shipping, for using blendings of biofuels, uh, but, but they seem to have failed, uh, failed uh, from not having uh, the, the, the right support from cargo owners and, and so we have had quite a lot of focus on finding cargo owners that are interested in joining us and we actually have a couple of them uh, that, that are very supportive and, and we think we will actually have them in, in, in the project proposal for the demonstration project that we are Going to write. We developed a, a calculator for estimating the price premium, premium per container, just to show, uh, see, see the, where the economic uh, business can be made, so to say. This uh, calculating tool uh, considers time in SECA, and that is based on, on, on technical issues because it seems that uh, biofuels should be blended in to marine gas oil rather than in heavy fuel oils. It, uh, it uh, estimates the total uh, TEU kilometers if you're a container, uh, container uh, have container ships. It doesn't necessarily need to be container ships, but we think that is the most suitable uh, first step for this study uh, and, and see how, how, many, uh, how many green TU kilometers for uh, transport work that, that can can actually be sold to an interested cargo owner. Um, you can change things like the drop-in percentage of your biofuel as well. And and this tool it answers questions like how many fossil-free 
TU kilometers can be sold for a journey, for example, between Shanghai and Gothenburg, if that's where you want to transport your container. Uh, the share of the container price that, uh, or, or the freight price, that is fuel cost, the increase in freight, freight cost due to the foresight free transport, uh, and basically we will have a number that, that uh, can help the cargo owner decide whether this is uh, a, a, a business case, if it's interesting or not. And this is just an example uh, that we set up. Uh, we took a 9000 TU container ship going from Shanghai to Gothenburg, uh, or a transport really for, for a container from Shanghai to Gothenburg. We used prices for fuels uh, uh, from averages for last year for MGO and HFO, and for vegetable oil we, we doubled the price of the gas oil, and that was based on the free on board prices last year for, for these two um, uh, these two fuel classes. And uh, you can actually see that that price is kind of similar to the gas oil, marine gas oil prices for, for just a few years back. The average freight cost of the container from Asia to Europe uh, we set to 1,000 US dollars per TU. And this is low, and this is a very, uh, this is a price that goes up and down quite a lot. This is just to show you what we use in the example here. Um, and uh, we have a fossil free premium of approximately 300 US dollars per TU when the container price is so low. And that, that is quite high, that is 30% increase. So this is probably not where we could, we could uh, convince anyone to, to do, uh, to start, an, uh, start using the biofuels. But if we go further in the consumer chain, chain we can see <coughs> the com commodity value uh, of, of, what's in, uh, of what's in the container, that's approximately 13,000 US dollars per TU. And this is, uh, these are the figures that we had from one of the companies that we discussed with. And this is what the, their purchase price. And then when it's, when it's sold in store, it can be up to 17,000 US dollars per, per, per TU. Uh, and that means that the biofuel would cause a consumer price increase of 1.6%. So this is probably what we actually can, can, can motivate. Some, some some initiatives and action. Uh, so so the next step we're going to do is invite a workshop or meeting to discuss around the, the application that we write for for the demonstration project, uh, which will be with cargo owners, ship owners, and fuel providers, and probably engine manufacturers and, and interested partners, of course. Uh, so thank you very much. <coughs> And these are the names of, oh, it's actually, you want to see and your CD didn't fit. <laughs> it's, it's the format of the presentation. So, it's <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and now our last speaker. And you will, of course, be able to, to uh, ask questions to uh, all of the presenters, uh, coffee break and lunch. Uh, next presenter is Carl uh, Garme from Stockholm. And every time he comes to Gothenburg, it's sunny and uh, not today. But you said it's just a little fog. It will be very yeah, nice This is, this is uh, nothing. It will be a bright afternoon, <laughs> probably. So th this uh, pre-study that you are presenting, is this, it's... Uh, an add-on on the first one, where you look more at, so the waterway, how, how can we actually make it happen? I hope. Well, you, um, we'll see if your hopes uh, match what I'm, uh, I'm going to say. So, uh, I'm um, Carl Garme, I work at the uh, uh, Center for Naval Architecture at KTH, and I represent KTH in the Lighthouse uh, uh, Program Committee. So, in the previous round of pre-studies, uh, I coordinated this study uh, and uh, we were particularly looking at how can we use the, the waterways, trying to see examples of how, what that could look like. And we uh, were uh, keen on finding 
the key values in uh, when is this uh, a suitable uh, and preferable way uh, of transport. And uh, the, the last and not the least thing was to see if are those pros, are they caught by, by the means we use to uh, typically do uh, uh, um, cost-benefit analysis and that thought of that type of uh, assessments to see if uh, it's um, worthwhile or a preferable, preferable way of transport. Uh, so, looking at the, the last one, which uh, is uh, related to this uh, appendix or part two of the study, and then so the conclusions from from the first part was that. Uh, there are room for, for development when it comes to, for instance, cost-benefit cost analysis. But on the other hand, it's not sort of far off. Uh, and uh, what was uh, uh, typically seen was that there could be a need for improvements when it comes to model of logistics, uh, cost-benefit analysis, and also an environmental risk assessment. And those Models are, of course, important in order to see the potential in, in using the uh, inland waterways. Uh, and uh, to <coughs> realize the potential, then we also uh, have to do some technical development, we concluded, and also uh, there might be need for well, coordination in societal planning when it comes to uh, to harbors and how uh, uh, the municipalities work together and so on and so on. But we also noticed that a lot of things were were going on, and that is the reason why we continued a bit. Uh, so again, on this um, uh, uh, this question, if the current methods. Uh, work. Uh, we can again say that, well, not always, but an important thing is that the uh, strategic directorate, the, the Swedish Transport Administration, they have a strategic planning for improving uh, the assessment models, and uh, they seem to be, uh, uh, they have noticed that there are room for improvement, and uh, the uh, um, Swedish National Audit Office uh, have investigated or followed up on their, uh, their uh, planning process and are quite happy about that. Interestingly enough, what they are not uh, as happy about is that they don't really see that cost-benefit analysis are so much uh, used when it comes to decisions. So that is actually something that they are pointing out and that they uh, want to have a much better follow-up on to see, well, do we take those analyses into consideration when we finally make uh, investment decisions? Uh, so, just briefly, some thoughts that I've come up with uh, uh, here that I think we can, um, well, that you can bring with you from from this meeting is uh, uh, if we do we really want to to do this modal shift that we have been talking about and the EU and and uh, Sweden for for so long time and if we are how what incentives are there in order to to realize that so one thing that is stressed in reports that have been published uh, during uh, 2017 and late 2016 is that there might be uh, well there, there is a need for improving coordination uh, uh, between ports between the regions in uh, in Sweden and it can also of course be uh, regions within sort of our uh, closest neighbors in in Europe but the incentives for for this improvement we can well, we can think where we can find them or how they could, uh, could come there. Uh, many of the pre-studies that have been presented today have, uh, have, have pointed at environmental 
their performance. And uh, we can again think about do we see the in incentives to really improve those? And I think a question that, that you had been to a lot of maybe if we could uh, make indices or measures dynamic that would be a, a great improvement because we have been talking about slow steaming and eco driving and things like that. But if we index and well, then follow, not follow up accurately enough on, on what we do in operation, maybe a lot is lost. Uh, and incentives for infrastructure investments. So as um, uh, the uh, National Audit Office had noticed, well, maybe we don't, uh, even though we do analysis, maybe that isn't even uh, in incentives to, uh, to invest in the needed infrastructure. And then when it comes to infrastructure, we have to think about what is infrastructure. And I will eventually come back to, to that. Just have a quick look at this graph. Uh, it's from uh, this year, and it uh, pinpoints something called external cost, which basically is uh, environmental and infrastructural costs, but it is per definition costs that are not carried by the one who's causing them. Uh, and uh, I think we can see interesting things here. Uh, this pinpoints the potential actually in moving cargo from uh, a land-borne means of transport to waterborne. Since basically since the, uh, uh, the difference in height here is uh, uh, that well seen. But also if we have a look at the, the red parts, and uh, that is, uh, you can say, costs that the society has to, uh, has to carry. And uh, so from a societal point of view, it could be quite beneficial uh, to, to lower this red part. And you can lower that by, by doing a modal shift. You can, of course, also do it by increase uh, taxes and, and fees. Uh, but when you remember this graph, when you, when you leave today, we can, we can see that the, um, the, the external cost for waterborne is about the same size as the non-internalized cost for, uh, for lorry, lorry transport. Then, of course, we are not able to shift everything uh, from, from landborne to waterborne, but there is a potential there to, to do savings. And if we have a look at, if we break those pillars down to uh, where those, where we have those costs or where they occur, and we have a look at, uh, at waterborne, I mean, we see why we have had all those uh, previous pre-studies here presented, because it's uh, the carbon dioxide and uh, other emissions, which is the, last, the, the largest part of, uh, of the external costs. We can also notice that the infrastructure is quite a small part here. And when it comes to indices and also to fees, uh, maybe it would be interesting if a larger part of the fee was related to the uh, environmental costs. And of course also if it could be dynamic, as you say, because then we could lower the cost uh, and there, by doing that, increasing the, uh, um, the internalization ratio. So, uh, read all the pre-studies we have, uh, have presented today, and why not also the one we did last year? Uh, then, finally here, the last thing that we can, uh, we can discuss over lunch is what is infrastructure. I think many of us would say that this is infrastructure, wouldn't we? Or no one against. So in this, um, this is uh, the fantastic uh, means of transport, the underground in Stockholm. Uh, but the owner of what we see here um, is actually the uh, 
uh, Stockholm County Council. So this is public owned, everything we see here. Uh, the trains are, uh, well, pretty expensive of course, but they also last for quite a long time. Mm. Uh, so they are rented for the company who is uh, uh, doing the, the service. And uh, so if we, and that is the only way the, the county council sees it as being able to uh, not having like 30 years of uh, contracts. So, uh, and this is, works perfectly well, but maybe this could be infrastructure too. What do you say about that? So if we think that it is a good idea to, to shift from, uh, from land to waterborne, maybe infrastructure should be, uh, the, the ships, maybe they should be included. And uh, then the, the, the ships and harbors and things are rented to the companies that uh, can provide the, the actual service. Will you propose that to the Swedish, the Stockholm County Council? Uh, uh, well, actually we do, when it comes to, uh, to uh, uh, waterborne commuter craft. And that is on, on their agenda, because they, in that case, also see that it's impossible to, uh, uh, to buy efficient craft, uh, or uh, require the one who operates to have uh, a modern and uh, an environmentally efficient craft. So there we will propose this. This you are to propose to someone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now for something completely different. So you have to uh, sort of shake your legs and stand up and sit down quickly. Uh, yeah. While I ask uh, the Lighthouse postdocs to uh, yeah. get on stage or on the floor. Okay, so now I was very uh, quick standing up and now we have to sit down again. Or you can stand up as long as you're not in the way for anybody else. Uh, and there is a coffee break quite soon where you can talk about all these interesting things. Uh, I'd like to present the Lighthouse Post Doctors and uh, here you can see them, uh, both in light and also uh, on, uh, on the screen. Carl Sandberg is not here today, he is together with another person who should have been here uh, at a seminar or conference on uh, autonomous ships. Um, this postdoc program was announced last year and it is the last funding from Vinova to Lighthouse that has been used uh, to boost the research uh, environments at uh, the universities that um, are participating in Lighthouse. And as you can see, we're, we here have uh, Ryuha Lu uh, working with uh, wind assisted propulsion, Michael Tanko, uh, waterborne urban mobility, Marta Gonzalez Arga, environmental control charges and incentive structures for ports and Anastasia Christodoulou, business administration and you have a special focus on RORO and I would like to ask you some questions and uh, you can pass the microphone so I will start with Anastasia so could you tell just a little about your research area okay, is it okay? My current research focuses on the diverse yes. aspects uh, of uh, rural shipping. Uh, it is quite interesting, especially for Sweden, as uh, Swedish rural ship research a quite large uh, percentage of the total cargo cargo handled in uh, the main ports of Sweden. 
Uh, it is uh, it, the Cyprus perspective uh, regarding rural services is uh, very important. As uh, this maritime segment, uh, the demand for this maritime segment uh, is much more elastic than say other maritime segments. It competes directly to road and rail transport and um, serves uh, some particular characteristics. Okay, uh, and can you say anything about what you think you are, how can your research be used? Okay, uh, we investigate and analyze the factors that influence uh, road shipping competitiveness and uh, we hope that our research will uh, uh, contribute to a model shift uh, from uh, uh, land-based uh, transport modes to sea transport. Uh, and uh, uh, um, we also investigate the, the effect that uh, incentives like uh, tax levy or, or the road transport or the speed uh, limits uh, could have in uh, on shippers uh, uh, on shippers uh, perspective if they would how they would uh, react on these uh, uh, incentives. Thank you. Could you pass on the microphone? Hi. And uh, Marta, you can tell us a little about your area of research. Okay. Um, what I did until now is uh, was my research was focused on. Uh, analyze port incentives and fees that uh, they apply for environmental performance and uh, I was basic on uh, focus on hinterland perspective so the idea was to uh, analyze which uh, how the port authorities applies different um, uh, incentives like to reduce air emissions to reduce noise to reduce uh, land congestions and um, the idea of this research, uh, we did, uh, we published a report at the GU, and uh, yeah, we tried to to analyze this. Okay. So, well, and what do you see as the next step in yeah. your research? Yeah, uh, we had a, a seminar last uh, June, and we discussed some uh, of our. I mean, what I found some, some examples around the world and we discussed uh, with some Swedish uh, stakeholders and, and Swedish uh, port authorities and they uh, evaluate them and I think that uh, this, this type of discussion and also to know what, uh, what is going on on different port authorities and different incentives uh, can help other ports and also uh, in that case, Sweden to to reduce. Um, I mean, to to improve uh, environmental uh, performance. Okay, thank you. And the next, uh, 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 could you tell us about? Are you actually inventing something, or are you? What are you doing? Uh, so currently, that uh, I'm doing the wind assisted propulsion technologies. So we have been developing some models to simulation the, to simulate the performance of the the flattener rotors as well as we are doing the the wind sails. So we are trying to find out how much fuel savings can be contributed by different technologies. So I got the the research background as the ship performance simulation and uh, the energy efficient shipping like the weather routing and the uh, voyage optimization. So I start from here and uh, in Sweden and start the, the wind assisted propulsion technology simulation. So for the future part that uh, I think I'd like to get involved in some project so to see uh, whether we can evolve this kind of new technologies into the shipping companies, uh, into the shipping activities as well. Uh, so I, I like to see that uh, we also have developed some models that can give a very accurate prediction of the ship performance uh, in different kind of weather conditions as well as the route planning. So that's it. Do you think we will see wind-assisted propulsion on merchant vessels uh, uh, in the future? 
Yeah, I think so. There are already some uh, around, uh, let's say, around uh, 10 projects is already undergoing, and some shapes, model shapes, is already developed, some actual shapes with the wind assisted propulsion technologies on board. Thank you. And last but not least, Michael Tenko from uh, under there, from Australia. <laughs> um, so my name is Michael. Um, I'm from Australia. Uh, my background is kind of a bit probably different. It's not really uh, marine sort of stuff. It's in like urban planning and um, transport planning. So I come at a background kind of coming at it from trying to think about how we can improve the, the water transport in Stockholm from a land use perspective, from passenger perspective, customer satisfaction, how we can think of the kind of soft kind of policies while I guess Carl and those guys are uh, designing ships and all that kind of stuff. I come at it from kind of the land use aspect and trying to figure how we can improve the public transport network on water in, in Sweden. I know you did a study before you came here about uh, do people actually think it's worth some extra time uh, spending on the water compared to on land in Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the and studies. And did they? What's that? Sorry? Did they? Did they? Yeah. So we found we we were interested because we always had this hypothesis that people kind of like to catch boats more than they catch buses. I mean, just anecdotal kind of kind of people talk about that. So we did a comparative study in Brisbane looking at that where we compared like a, a co-located bus and ferry terminals and we kind of looked at all the, the data to see if people are traveling further and we found that people were. And that's actually kind of what I'm doing now um, here is kind of trying to unpack that by doing some custom surveys. So we did some surveys with SL in Stockholm, um, basically asking, you know, what passengers, you know, what, what, what do you like about being on board? What is the, is it just kind of, the atmosphere? Is it the kind of smooth ride? Is it can you do work on board? So I think those are really important aspects, especially if you want to design new vessels, if you want to kind of increase the mode share of um, water transport in Stockholm or in Sweden in general. We need to know what passengers are actually interested in doing on board and what their kind of attitudes are towards on board facilities. Thank you very much. Uh, you will be here uh, participating today and if anybody has any questions or anything they, you think they should look into more in detail, you're very welcome to talk to them. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, these two uh, researchers are also partly financed uh, by these Vinova money Sophia, you already saw here, uh, because we also think that uh, this is a really important issue to work more into. And uh, Robert Rivander, so also uh, partly funded, working with autonomous safety on the vessels. Now I think we have uh, maybe caught up a uh, little. So you are thereby gratified with some coffee. <laughs>
as you can see on this uh, slide, we have two upcoming events uh, next week. Roro, the future for Roro, the spicy, very interesting, as we heard here, from uh, one of our postdocs. Last day to register today. And uh, then uh, in January, together with Stena, we will have uh, Greg Stone uh, that will talk about. He has written a book called Soul of the Sea in the Age of the Algorithm. And uh, it will probably be very interesting. And the new <coughs> general director of uh, Hafs Vattenmyndigheten will also be there. So you're very welcome to this. And now I leave the stage and the floor and uh, the computer and everything to you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for inviting me here. This is uh, where I like to be. I'm a sailor. My father was a shipbuilder, and my son is a sea captain. So, well, I'm a physicist. <laughs> so, um, uh, what I'm invited to talk about is uh, is sustainability transition. And this is what I have been working with the latest 25 years, more or less, since I wrote my dissertation and worked with and started up the, the natural step, guiding companies already 89. We had a booklet for all households, <laughs> uh, actually, and a tape record uh, for all households in Sweden to start this um, event with. And, and the whole idea with that activity was to just try to find ways into sustainability. And in my dissertation I developed some, some guiding principles for that transition. So, I will talk about more or less this. What will it imply if we want to reach 10 billion people, happy people on this planet, what will that imply? And how can we understand that transition? And this is becoming, becoming more and more important for the global society. So the 17 Sustainable Development goal, Goals uh, developed in this Agenda 2030, it's much bigger event than the eight millennia goals. It, it was much broader scope, it was industry involved and NGOs involved and, and it was in, biggest event ever in New York with, uh, with um, government leaders uh, uh, when they launched this in September 2015. And uh, it is on a much higher level. It has been an environmental issue very long, but now it is on the highest level. And every year all nations meet in New York, in something called the High Level Political Forum for Sustainable Development, and they talked about what is happening in each uh, country uh, in this progress. I was invited in the Swedish delegation this year to be there, uh, and I've been very much involved in the preparation of this agenda. <laughs> and what there are some, some keywords that can be <laughs> recognized in this agenda. And I think that it, they are actually really good for understanding what it's all about. It is a transition. It, something old has to disappear and something new has to grow up and replace what has been. It's not just a marginal change. It is a transition of many, many systems, this agenda. So business as usual is not an option in many, in many branches. Another is, there is a need for integration. Often we talk, we meet and talk about carbon dioxide and climate effect. And somewhere else they talk about social aspects of society. And then in a third meeting, it's a business meeting, we call about, talk about economy. But what is recognized is that we have to integrate these, uh, all the, the perspective of sustainability if we want to achieve 
sustainability. And how can we do that? Because we are not trained to do that. We are trained to be in silos and working with one issue at a time. This is a challenge for every organization, even university, or more, actually. <coughs> oh, we don't have to go into that. <laughs> uh, and that also means that we probably need to work together to a large extent. Because we, don't, we cannot do it on ourselves. We cannot, it's not a research project. It's not a, a, a project for the public sector. It's, and the industry cannot do it themselves. It is an, a, it's a new way of working together. And that is challenging, of course. But it is also so that the companies, organizations, understanding how to do this the best way maybe have some kind of advantage when it comes to transition, if you really think that this will happen. The third, the third word is universality, leaving no one behind. We cannot solve the problem within Sweden, and, and that is enough. It, is, has, it has to be solved everywhere, if you want to reach sustainability. Sustainability is reached when it's reached everywhere. So those are the three keywords, and I will come back to them. I will quickly go through some challenges we are facing right now, and I will try to stress the fact that it is about a transition. And then I will go into how to work with this. And later, after lunch, we will work with this as well, in workshop. So first, very quickly, we are, we have, we are facing a double challenge. Today, resources are declining and demands are increasing. And there are three factors driving the demands and three factors limiting the resources. And the first factor uh, uh, driving the demand is population, of course. And we are used to learn about this exponential growth of population. But as you see here, the growth rate is declining fast. So it's two children families almost everywhere. That means that this curve is leveling off now. And that is happening quite quick. Almost in all continents. It is Africa that is a little bit uncertain. It is 800 million people in Africa today about. And it is expected to be up to 3.6 billion depending on if they can and how they can manage to uh, go out from poverty, because that is the key here. As soon as you leave poverty, it is two children per family, almost everywhere. And you see it in Indonesia, you see it almost everywhere. So that is, but if that will happen, then we'll be we level off at about 10 billion or less. And then it will level off and maybe decline. And then we have urbanization. This is from Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, that is happening very fast. Uh, it will be double amount of people living in cities in 30 years. But that will happen in 30 years, and then we, the, the urbanization had, had been done. It cannot continue. So that is also a transition during 30 years of urbanization, as the population grew with this. And here's another factor connected with population, aging population. And uh, of course, if there are many old people with many brothers and sisters, we have, who has to be supported with uh, children with very few brothers and sisters. This is a great challenge. But as soon as it is few brothers and sisters getting older, supported by fewer brothers and sisters, it will also be a transition. We have to understand the dynamics here. So it is a transition very much in population, and we are into it. It's happening right now. Economy is the same. You don't see the, the growth anymore where you used to see it in US, 
Europe and Japan. It is elsewhere, and that is how it should be, because we, we cannot do it so much better uh, things anymore in Sweden. But there are great potential elsewhere to increase uh, the rate of growth. And that also means that we have to promise our population something else. And what is that? And maybe that is not necessarily bad for people, that we focus on something else than growth. So that is what you can see also in the debate. What could that be? And then it's the distribution of wealth, and that is an issue in itself, and that is a tricky one. And this is, I really recommend you to look into this uh, um, illustration. It is a dynamic illustration done by in, at Harvard University of wealth distribution in the US. And uh, actually, this is very much what is happening in Sweden as well right now. So that is a tricky one. How can we manage this? without, in an in, in, in acceptable way. So, money per capita, but then it is also kilo and, and, and kilo euro per dollar that is driving, driving <coughs> demand. How heavy is the, um, the consumption? And in Sweden we can see that the energy demand per uh, krona is increasing almost linear. So if you earn 10% more, you use about 8% more energy. And that is about linear. So it's Swedish households here. But it is something here that is quite promising, and that is if you compare one income group, oh, this is Swedish, uh, sorry for that. Uh, one income group, so this is income here and energy use here. Uh, if you compare one income group with um, the 10% least energy use with an income group with 10% highest in, uh, energy use. The difference between those two groups are 350%, quite huge. And it's still the same amount of money to spend. So they choose to spend it in this way and they choose to spend it in that way. The question is, are they much less happy than those are? they are? And what we have found out is they are not. So there is a great potential in how to change the consumption. Actually, if you have materialistic ideas that hinder you for focus on what is really relevant for being, bringing happiness, and that is social uh, focus ideas. And then we have three restrictions when it comes to uh, resources, and that is, of course, the more traditional uh, uh, resource restrictions, that is, for example, oil, but it's also uh, metals. And when it comes to oil, there are, as you understand right now, a great transition away from oil. And when it comes to metal, it's quite interesting to, or uh, you should really recognize that you can actually recycle a metal how many times you want. There is no limitation. <coughs> you don't burn out metal. And gold, we have recycled with a very high efficiency for many, many years. And the reason why we're not recycling other metals to the same degree is that the, the scarcity price happened in economical terms very, very late, when you really face scarcity. That means that you don't plan smart in ahead when it comes to scarcity. So, for example, the Swedish forest, um, the rent means that we shouldn't really uh, plant new trees north of, I don't know, Umeå maybe. Because it do not make economical sense to do that. Therefore we have a law that we should do that. Because we understand it's good to plant trees for the future. And maybe we have to correct some of the economical instrument with some other policy instrument in the future. And we will see that in the cyclic society, I will see. And there is a great potential. It is a take making waste society we are living in. And here we will see great transition as well when it comes to material, use of materials. And then we have a stronger restriction, that is assimilation restriction. That is what nature can take care of when we emit it. So this is probably more stronger restriction for fossil fuels, or it is. 
than fossil, the, the amount of resources. And uh, this is quite, this, this is now the bond meeting, actually happened now. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the forecast for 2100, and this is not an extreme one, you should know. This the three, uh, 700, it is in the upper layer, but it's not the most extreme one. So it is, we are in a track right now that mean, if you want to change that, uh, transition of a lot of uh, system. So there is, a total, there is a total difference between reduce carbon dioxide with 20% and reducing carbon dioxide with 80-90%, which we are facing. 20% we can do by efficiency measures, but 80-90%, if we're going into that track, if we're forced to go into that track, it will be a transition of what we're used to see. And then we have land area restrictions. And of course, if you need to compete for land, for food, materials, <coughs> biodiversity, and others, the food price will increase. But here we also see possible transitions. And one is that we don't need to, first we can use, we have very low efficiency in, uh, in soils in Africa, for example, and Kofi Annan is now uh, really working hard in this agri system to, 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 to link capital into <coughs> to making that system uh, be improved. So there is a great potential for improving a lot of uh, uh, soils in the agricultural system, but there are also potential in not competing for food on this kind of land. If you go for this technology, for example, it means much greater area efficiency when it comes to translating and transforming sunlight into energy. Much greater area efficiency. But also, they do not have to be installed on agricultural land. It can, they can be installed in deserts, on hoof, rooftops, and, and other places. And more interesting, they are, do not really in, involve resources and emissions. They are built and they are there, transforming sunlight into electricity for about 30 years. And you need to clean them once in a while, but otherwise very little material use uh, connected with them. And they can be produced wherever. So the scale of economy means that the, the price, the cost will drop radically. And this is the area needed for PVs to supply 10 billion people with electricity or energy for the total energy system, <laughs> transportation, everything. So there is a great potential in that technology. And that is coming quite quick because the cost is dropping very quick. And here we should thank the German people, actually, <laughs> took a lot of the cost in the beginning for that and uh, made, made it possible for, for, for this thing, this <coughs> Uh, dramatic change to happen. So that is what we see and that is of course one way to look at it that it, it will be worse and worse and worse and very little of um, hope into the future. Another way to think about this is that it is about a transition. Every factor here is under transition and you have to understand in which way they are transforming. And if you take it like that, you can instead focus on what will be the alternative route into the future and how can we understand that? How can we understand what this transition actually implies? And what they mean, what it means? And I think that you if you want to do that, you have to understand innovation in another way. Because we used to understand innovation oh, first, the transition, trans the transition we have uh, already recognized from the agricultural society into industrial society, from low intensity, low efficiency, low material into high intensity, very low efficiency, efficiency take making waste and high material. And we saw the transition happen uh, a little bit more than 100 years back 
And this is from London, 1900. You couldn't spot a single car here. You cannot spot a single car. It was already constructed. It was called horseless carriage. We couldn't imagine something on wheels, not with a horse connected to it. And then it com came the T Ford, uh, 08. And, and at that time, people were occupied by still calculating how to manage this system with horses. And uh, how can we improve that system? How can we get out the manure from the city and all that? That was the, what we had all, all the research doing, all the planning doing, all the industry doing. And then, 10 years later, you couldn't spot a single horse in New York, London, or Paris. And that was already 1915. So this happened very quick. And that transformed, of course, the whole city structure and many other aspects connected to that, that transformation. And this transformation we are now facing is into high intensity, of course, 10 billion people maybe, but much higher efficiency, much higher efficiency in using resources into something good for people. And that also means much lower material growth. And what will that, what will that transition imply? We already now see a lot of destructive technologies facing the market. This has happened very quick now, doubling every two years. Minus 15% of costs for batteries per year. Five years back, 10 years back, Volvo didn't really care about electricity. Two years back, they understood that we have to go almost all in. And now they talk about replacing diesel uh, de development department with electric development department. And of course, it's much better to stand in, in electric vehicles, much fewer moving parts, but also, you understand, my grandchildren will ask me, what did you say? Did you spend? 20 lessons to drive a car? Didn't you just push the gas pedal? What did you do? What, what, gearing stick? What, what, why did you have that kind of equipment? And starting in a hill? Is that difficult? You, it, what, you know, it's so much <laughs> better prestanda in this, uh, in this uh, car. Acceleration and everything. And then it's parked 96% of the time. So here we will see great transformation because people will want this to happen. And you'll see so much more. 3D printing and big data, graphene materials and so on. It's coming. And do you have a sense of what that will imply for the maritime sector? This really transformed the maritime sector once. The container. And this might be something. This might this is from outside here. The foiling system. Other, I don't know. What will happen? And here you see the larger company by market capitalization. We had one IT company in 2002. Now it's only IT. We always uh, underestimate the power of digitalization and the phase speed it's coming. And here it is the potential uh, digitalization will have to change the uh, transport sector, building sector, industry sector, when it comes to energy use. And here is the barrier for digitalization. Here you have unmanned shipping, but here you have land transportation. And of course, that will also influence the shipping if they run on something else than diesel, oil, and petrol. 
So this means that we have to, as I understand it, uh, think of innovation in another way. We used to think of innovation as it's a bright idea that has to reach the market, the customers. And the brighter idea, the better it is. Thinking outside the box. Then, the industry today understands that we cannot think that we have all the ideas in our own industry. We have to go out in the market and try to understand what is the need. And be with the customer. And understand the customer. And adapt to the customer. And then innovate. That means that instead we have the demand-driven innovation as a concept, which, we, which enter the industry as a more design process, starting from the need and then innovate. It seems like push and pull. That is everything, is it? I think it's not. I think something else is coming now. Because what we have been used to when it comes to driving a car or uh, using a ferry. That is quite <coughs> stable in its regime with existing knowledge, diesel engineers in Volvo, technology, market, legislation, policy, everything is adapted to that regime. Also culture and norms. And you cannot just change that. Because Diesel engineers do not want electricity to enter Volvo. It is a fight within the company. It is if every, everywhere you will see that this is momentum 22. Until something happens, until an app coming, entering the taxi market or, or something else, from outside, a destructive technology entering the system. Because then they have to adopt it. Otherwise, they will be out of market. But what is happening now is that you also understand that the re sustainability requirements are for real. They will really force industry to change. So do you, if you understand the sustainability requirement, you can prepare for the future market. Because the sustainability requirement will change the whole box. The whole box will change. And that is something else than push and pull. If push is entrepreneurial thinking, very much. You have an idea and you want to try to figure out what resources do I have to make that happen, entering the market. That is the framework for uh, idea-driven innovation. And demand-driven innovation is based on design thinking. How can I understand the need? And how can I, based on those needs, try to develop my idea? Then sustainability-driven innovation or challenge-driven innovation is based on the understanding of the future and the gap between the future and what exists today. And then that very much is about understanding how the box will change actually, rather than thinking outside the box. But it is also about backcasting. That is the thinking in challenge driven innovation. Mm -hmm. And what is backcasting then? Backcasting is that you start not by understanding today's situation, what is happening now, and making indices for today's situation. It is starting from the future, trying to understand the condition that needs to be met in the same the future. It identify guiding principles questions. That is the starting point to actually thinking outside the whole regime. And then trying to understand what do we have today? What does it look like today? And what is the gap between today's situation and the future? And that gap between the future and today's situation, that gap is then what drives the innovation. That is sustainability or challenge of innovation. It's not the need, it's not the idea, it is a gap that is driving the innovation. Of course, the ideas and the needs are important, but the driving force is in this gap. 
and the understanding of that gap. And based on that understanding of that gap between today's situation and future, you can identify leverage points and start to design future possibilities that bridge the gap. And you can try to make those come true by navigating in this system in the right way. So that is the idea, how to enter the future market based on challenge-driven innovation, as I see it. And that is what I have been working with for many years. And now it's, it seems like uh, it is need, it's urgently needed. And what is backcrossing? It is something that is, we are very, very used to that. Backcrossing from principles. For example, if you want to move from Stockholm, from KTH to Chalmers, maybe? No. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but, 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 but from Stockholm to Gothenburg. Suppose that that would happen. Then you put up some guiding principles. First, I need to afford the house. It should be a certain distance or not too far away from my working place. It has to meet some basic requirement for my family. And it has to meet some building standards. And those need to be fulfilled in that project in the future. And they guide me wherever I do, when I look for the houses. It never happened that I enter up in, a, in another city, in Malmö, or in a castle, or, you know, that never happened. But all the details you can, of course, discuss. And you do that every time as a human being in your planning, backcasting. But we, as a society, we very much are in the present and just look. What are they, the neighbors doing? What are what, what are the competitors doing? What is uh, what is the legislation saying today? Very few is looking and trying to backcast from principles. But that is happening. That that is happening, and they are quite brave and transformative. Those companies. So what it is about is the backcasting from principles also help you if you want to innovate into the future. If you are in today and you want to make some concrete innovation into the future. It's very, if you only think about the concrete measures, going for solutions, you're very much faced, uh, you're, you're in the dictatorship of the pre present when you think about the future, because they are so, you're, you're so flavored by what it looks like today when you try to think about the concrete future. So what the guiding principles help you to do is to go into an abstract presentation of that future with guiding principles. Not knowing about the house, what it look like, but the guiding principles are there. And then you're freer in your mind when you look for the house. And the, if you have guiding principles, you're freer to understand what kind of possible innovation can be seen. You're not so strict to what you have already experienced. So when you work with backcasting, we see three spaces for change. One is very much linked to this sustain, broader sustainability issue, humanity, the transition of society into 10 billion people society. And Gro Harlan Brundtland has the most famous report from 87 where she defined, or the World Commission defined sustainable development as meeting the needs today without compromising future relations to meet their own needs. Needs here and needs here. It's about needs. It's about well-being today and well-being in the future. That is sustainable development. Then I, in my dissertation, start to think about Okay, if you want to make that happen, we have to make sure that we do not destroy nature at least. And how can we find guiding principles for that? So I developed a set of principles and they were then spread by this natural step. And one is principle combining the nature with well-being to help and uh, guide the thinking about that future. But now we understand that the social aspect and economic aspect, aspect are also need to be saved 
uh, for their own sake if you want this to be ha happen. So there is a social aspect and economic aspect that has to be explored as well. So the future is about well-being and it's about human needs, human rights, other aspects of well-being into the future. What kind of so, uh, life do we want to live in the future? And nature, of course, is to fit within the carrying capacity of nature. The social aspect is about how can we live together? How on earth can we live together? And that is becoming one of the most urgent questions, actually, when it comes to sustainability. <coughs> and that is about trust within society, very much. Trust between us, uh, neighbors and workmates, but also trust on a vertical level. Trust for the government and uh, uh, institutions. And it's about equity. How do we think about equity for 10 billion people? Is it based on the needs or the merits? And that discussion will be extremely important in the future. And the economical side of sustainability is about how can we save resources for the future. It's about natural, natural resources, material energy, of course, the cyclic society. It's about infrastructure that we have already built. It's about knowledge. How do we invest in, in knowledge for the future? And it's about uh, economy and debt. So, for all those aspects, we can better and better find, uh, identify questions related to those. For example, here we have the whole system of cyclic society just connected to that, that, that question. And uh, we can better and better understand, explore what this actually means for the future. And the 17 sustainable development goals are also linked to this. But they are more difficult, they are more like stories, like uh, sustainable cities and communities. Of course, it's very much linked to the social aspect, but a lot of sustainable cities and communities are about ecological concern, economic concern, and well-being. So this structure actually are more generic and can be applied for every goal as a starting point for asking questions. And what is then the strength of um, guiding principles for sustainability? This guy, he actually did it. He put up a set of guiding principles for the future equal rights, no violence, and then he practices it in reality. Experimentation with the salt, Mars, and everything. What we often do is we stay with the visionary documents and we do not test the exp experiment. Or we, we are just an entrepreneur without direction. We don't think about sustainability when we come up with ideas. It is a combination of guiding principle and experimentation that make it happen. And that is actually what he did. And his biography was called Experimentation with Truth. And he was very uh, true to his guiding principles, as you know, but he was also experimentating a lot. And you can see that happen uh, in other transformative processes. Can you imagine that this, this thing that happened in India could happen without guiding principles, with a planning process, with a uh, neoclassic economical thinking. Will that, would that be enough? I don't think. I think this was essential with guiding principles and experimentation. And also in other processes which I have studied. And uh, Martin Luther King, he said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a nightmare. <laughs> it's also important that the guiding principle has to be something attractive. <laughs> so the guiding principle has to be something that you want to actually see be fulfilled. 
So that is about that space for change. Then it's another space for change, and that is if you really want to co-create this future, we have to create a space for that co-creation. And that is not done easily. You have to have thought that through. Because it is so important how that is done. Collaboration is actually built on trust. And trust is created by understanding each other. And trying to understand each other, you do by dialoguing and listening. So invest in dialogue and listening to understand, create trust for collaboration and creativity and innovation. So that is interesting. The greatest power in creativity is where you have the greatest trust. Because then you can dare to make mistakes. What is often happening is that you miss that. You focus on the costs. And then you cut down what is important. The unnecessary listening and dialogue. And you start to misunderstand each other. And this will be a lack of trust. And social separation, redundancy, the same thing is done in many places. Increased costs, decreased resources, internal competition. Within and between organizations. And that creates fear in organization or between organization and that creates social separation. So this is what we want to see happen in this kind of co-creating processes. And that means that you have to invest in this kind of listening and art in the right way. It creates a space for change and to see. So giving the right condition and then taking a step back rather than uh, starting to steer and control because it's created totally different engagement into that room of co-creation. And then we are there as persons, of course, and a real change starts with the insight that we are part of the system we should seek to change. We are not outside the system. And that means that we have to challenge ourselves. We have to challenge our own mind, our assumption. Am I always right? Can we see this from another perspective? Do I have a perspective awareness? The heart. Do I want to understand another? Can I actually um, have some compassion? And then the will, the courage to challenge your own agenda. And that is, uh, of course, how can you create this in this transformation process? One thing that we have recognized is that you, if you work with values, if you try to understand your own values, then you can create this kind of courage. That is quite interesting to see organization working with the company values. If they understand the company values, that is important to a very so small degree. But if you understand your own values, it means a lot when it comes to if you want to be part of the uh, transition or not. So to sum, sum it up, it's about think big, have the big picture, stay in the questions, stay in the principle, guiding principles, have the guiding principles there, start small, experiment, act now, test, 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 in order to learn fast. And then you can set up this kind of lab uh, activity connected to the traditional uh, activity and test it out with the right people that need to be there, not only the internal staff, but also the other that needs to be there to influence your transition. And this is about testing in a way that you can, you can afford the mistake. Transition, it's not a good idea to change the whole business just by an idea. Maybe you should have some kind of activity parallel to what you do and have that room there for co-creation testing and then learn. And you make mistake in that lab. And that's good that it happened there, not in the traditional um, activity or, or, or um, what you do. And if something is successful, then you can implement it in your, in your work. 
So setting up this kind of labs, I think, will be very important. I think that is something that Lighthouse actually can be a very important vehicle for doing. Because there is a need for a lot of different labs into this future, in different aspects. And maybe we are the people we have been waiting for, because this is happening now. It's actually <laughs> happening now. The people we are educating at Chalmers right now, they are the people who need to transform, make this transition happen. You and their working life. Huge duty. Do you feel the pressure? <laughs> there is also, of course, if you take it in the right way, a lot of possibilities. Because if you understand this, it implies a lot of possibilities. And that is what we will focus on uh, this afternoon, after the lunch. Then we will do the first step, or part of the first step in backcasting. So I have used some maritime, maritime uh, photos here to illustrate the process. First is, of course, to have a light out also used because of the, the because of OSA. <laughs> we need some direction. We need to understand which way should we go. We have to understand and stay in that question for a while. What does that mean? What does sustainability mean? What direction will guide us? So that is the first step. And the, the, that guidance, that lighthouse can be, of course, for the whole system, but it can also be for the group. How should, what guiding principles should you have the group? And for, the, for yourself, what guiding values do I have for myself? And now we only focus on the first one, for the whole system. And then we need to map up the system. What does it look like? And not just look above the surface, water, water surface. We have to understand what is below. We have to understand the cause, causal loop below what we see as symptom. And that is the second step, to map that out. And the third step is this expedition into the unknown water. And then you need a smaller, more flexible car, uh, ship, a small lab, to test it out and see what can happen, how can we, how can we uh, what, what, what can go wrong, and what can we test out. And then you report back to the big ship. And then you start to navigate with the big ship into that future. So that is the process for backwards. But we will start with this. Uh, we will start with this to, um, to this afternoon. And uh, we will start with uh, to discuss each dimension of sustainability and what that will imply in general for society for the future society, not today, but the future society. We will then try to understand how that will influence the maritime sector, what possibilities uh, and opportunities that, that can bring for the maritime sector. And the important thing here is to stay in the question. Do not run for solution, because that is what you are trained to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, now I have an idea, I have an idea, and I have an idea. But Stay there, stay in the back. How can we understand that future? Because if you understand that better together, you can be much smarter and more transformative in your solutions. So this is, this is, uh, um, think about that. So that will happen before the coffee break, and after the coffee break, and you will have the lighthouse with a four dimension on each table. So we have the four dimension there with some questions so that they can guide you. And you will have a, a chairman on each, uh, each table fully prepared for this exercise. <laughs> <laughs> we talked for five minutes. <laughs> uh, and then after lunch break, or after the coffee break, we will continue a discussion of disruptive technology. Or you can, you can actually decide yourself how you will devote the time. But you cannot, if you want to, continue that discussion. Disruptive technologies. Disruptive technologies that is internal for the ship, when it comes to the hull, navigation, propulsion, all that that is internal for the ship. And then uh, disruptive technologies important for external factors, 
we cha change the market, uh, the need for transportation, and maybe also the balance in competition for that uh, for that uh, uh, service of of transportation. So that is what will happen after lunch. But we will meet here again, and we will meet uh, one hour from now. Yes. Yes. And uh, and then we will have another uh, organization of the room with tables, and you will have. Uh, yes. Maybe you can explain that because I don't see it wrong. Is it on? Yes. So uh, you have a number on your uh, badge, and some of you will actually have changes because there was. Uh, We've had some uh, dropouts. One was going home for his pregnant wife was about to give birth, and uh, um, another one had a crisis at work. So uh, we will have six tables, and uh, I will talk. It will be table one where you will have to go elsewhere, but I will talk to each of you. Um, and it says here on your badge, so you should. Please take uh, your bags and your uh, clothes and hang them or put them here because we are going to rearrange the tables uh, during lunch. And uh, then we will, you will come back here all and then we will have, I don't know, five tables here maybe and another table in another room and uh, where you will have your interesting discussions. Yeah. And this will be on the table for the first discussion. So you have some guidance, what to talk, talk about. Uh, and I, I suggest that you take one question at a time and you start to think by yourself for some minutes before you start the discussion for each. And then you start. Uh, so about one hour, about one hour for each discussion. Okay, so that's everything for me right now. And now you will go for lunch, it will be downstairs, uh, and uh, please bring your, or move your belongings from the chairs, and we will uh, rearrange, and be back in one hour.